1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. Seinfeld, season 2, episode 11, The Chinese Restaurant. Jerry, Elaine, and George endure a series of misadventures while waiting the entire episode to get a table at a Chinese restaurant. A high point in the comedy is when the Chinese maitre d' calls Cartwright instead of Costanza, and they can't understand what he's saying. We're in the Cartwright section of 1 Corinthians 14. It's where Paul goes to some lengths to point out that when what you say cannot be understood by others, it cannot benefit them. 1 Corinthians 14, 6 says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Now, I must reiterate something we established in our previous study about the gift of speaking in tongues. In this chapter, Paul has in mind their practice in Corinth of speaking in tongues without any corresponding gift of interpretation. It is uninterpreted tongues that are the problem in Corinth. When an utterance in tongues is interpreted and is therefore intelligible, it is on an equal par with any other speaking gift. Interpreted tongues edifies, it builds up, it's beneficial. Uninterpreted tongues doesn't do any of that, and it cannot do any of that in Paul's theology. Uh, You and I might have our own ideas about that, but that's what Paul says. Now, if Paul were to come to their meetings and speak with uninterpreted tongues, it would not, it could not profit them. Um, Sometimes you just have to take the word at face value. You know, I, I, because I know people say, well, you know, Paul says that, but, but I feel edified or I feel built up or I feel blessed when an entire congregation is singing in tongues. And I'm not saying it wouldn't be a, a great phenomena or a, something maybe even beautiful to listen to, but Paul says you, it's not beneficial. It, it, it just isn't a way that the Holy Spirit can benefit the hearers. He does mention four examples of speaking that do, do profit everyone. We're not exactly sure what Paul meant by the word revelation. It may refer to the unique gift of an apostle revealing the word of God as Paul was doing in this letter to them. Knowledge we take to be the gift of the word of knowledge, knowing by the Spirit something that you did not know or find out for yourself. Prophesying we've talked about, it's an immediate word from God, including a verse or verses from the Bible, which is the word of God that speaks to the situation a believer or believers are in. It's, it's a word that speaks to you right where you're at to give you direction or counsel or wisdom. Teaching certainly encompasses what we recognize as formal teaching of the word, but it would include anointed use of God's word in discipling and otherwise instructing believers in a less formal setting. And when Paul is talking about teaching in this chapter, uh, he's... Uh, at least talking about the possibility that somebody other than the pastor would have a word that functions as a teaching. Not that there would be, you know, a bunch of different teachings, but that there is a possibility that others would have something to say from the Lord, from a passage of Scripture, more than just sharing the Scripture. And so, um, it would be wrong to say Paul was ranking these speaking gifts in order of importance. There, there's no, I know we have a, te- we want to do that. We, we always put things, or we have a tendency to put things in order from the most important to the least, or vice versa, telling people, you know, we have top 10 lists and top five lists, and some start at 10 and go to one, some, you know, they, but when we read the Bible that way, unless he's telling us that he's giving us some kind of an order of importance, we're reading that in. And so he's not uh, giving us an order of importance. We've established in previous studies from what Paul has said that the best or the greater gift is always whichever one is needed to accomplish God's purposes at the time. I mean, when you, come, when you are doing a project and you come forward with just the right tool to do that job, you know, when you're trying to change your tire on the freeway and somebody has a lug wrench, that, that's, you know, and you've been doing it with a crescent wrench, uh, that, you know, now you're talking. And so what's the best tool? Well, it depends on where you are and what you need. And so uh, none of these are better gifts than others. They're just different 
uh, and there's no order to them. Now, it's interesting to note, though, that revelation and knowledge and prophecy and teaching are mentioned here as four separate manifestations of the Holy Spirit, or at least there's the possibility that they're separate. Cessationists, and by the way, those of you who haven't been here before, a cessationist is someone who believes that uh, certain gifts of the Spirit have ceased to function in the modern church, or actually past the first century. They like to argue that the pastor, in his formal teaching of the Bible, automatically exercises all four of these gifts. But it would seem that Paul thought any one of them could be exercised independently of the others by laypersons who were thus gifted by the Holy Spirit. Regardless of the finer points of these four gifts, the argument Paul was making is clear. They profit the Christian because they are spoken in language that is intelligible and can be understood by any and all in the assembly. Now, to drive home his point, Paul appeals to two analogies, musical instruments and foreign languages. And so let's take a look at verses 7 and 8. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Now, this always reminds me of the game show, uh, Name That Tune. You remember Name That Tune? Uh, there's been a lot of different versions of Name That Tune. It's pretty amazing, really, how quickly you can recognize certain songs. In the more modern versions of the show, they also give you verbal clues, and sometimes you can guess the song without even hearing a single note. Uh, I, that's lame. That, that, I think that takes away from the show. I remember watching it as a kid and thinking, well, I can name that song without any notes because you've told me... You know, it was so-and-so's first hit on the such-and-such -such album. I mean, they, they have to dumb it down. You know, Jeopardy used to be for people who really were smart. You used to have to know something to be on Jeopardy. You know, they had real questions. Now, not so much. I figure if I can answer most of the Jeopardy questions, it's, it's pretty bonehead, you know. So every now and then they throw in something important, but uh, name that tune. Musical instruments must make distinct sounds in order for you to understand the song that's being played. A military trumpet must make distinct sounds if you're to understand the orders that are being given. Now I've officiated at the gravesides of funerals in which a military honor guard is on hand, and one of the things they do is play taps. It's getting rare to have a bugler who can actually play taps live. The ceremonial bugle was therefore introduced so that veterans' families have a choice now on how taps will be sounded when a live bugler is not available for a military funeral. And so you can request an honor guard, usually at a minimum of two individuals who will come in uniform to um, perform a, sh a small ceremony, a flag unfolding and refolding and presentation and then the playing of taps. And if there's not a person available who can actually play the bugle, used to be you, you could only opt for a taped performance of it. And they would have a boom box and, you know, a cassette or a, 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 you know, MP3 or something like that, and they would play taps. Now they have the ceremonial bugle, which is a real bugle, but it has an electronic insert that enables the individual to play it without actually playing it, and it's perfect, but you still have the symbolism, which is really moving, very powerful if you've ever you know, been to a funeral where taps is played. And so it, it does, I have to admit, it does take something away from taps when you're listening to it on a boom box. It, it just doesn't seem as, as, um, as meaningful. And so, but if you've got a guy, and most of the time people don't realize that it's, a, it's electronic. Uh, they, they think, man, they, in fact, I try, I, I do my best to keep to myself because I don't want to blow anybody's bell, but they come up and say, man, that's, that was a beautiful, perfect rendition of taps. How did that guy do it, especially without, you know, and I said, well, it's, it's electron. Then they don't believe me, and they want to get to the bugle and see the insert. But anyway, so I hope I haven't blown anybody's mind with that or ruined your day. But verse 9, so likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will you know what is spoken, for you will be speaking into the air? Pardon the pun, but I think Paul was being a little tongue-in-cheek. 
Yeah. When he said, you'll be speaking into the air. They were wasting their breath is basically what he's saying. So he's saying, you're speaking in tongues, but you're only wasting your breath. Verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Uh, this is a, a, another example, another analogy now that he goes into. He says, if someone speaks to you in a foreign language, you cannot understand them without it being translated. It is frustrating and confusing. In that same way, when someone speaks in an unknown tongue, you cannot understand them without an interpretation. It is frustrating and confusing. Now, something more needs to be said about this. I've mentioned it once before, but it's a very important point. We need to be reminded this is an analogy. Paul was not saying that tongues is a known foreign language that I have not learned but could if I wanted to. He was saying that speaking in tongues publicly without the corresponding gift of interpretation is like a foreigner speaking to me in a language I do not know. That's what it's like. An analogy of something is not the thing itself. You pick an analogy so that someone can understand from a more common example what you're talking about. And so Paul is not saying tongues is a language that can't be understood unless it's translated. He's saying it's totally unknown and unknowable, and the effect of speaking it without an interpretation is like listening to foreign people talk without translation. Now, we've talked at some length previously about why we believe that the supernatural gift of speaking in tongues is not a known or knowable human language. The use of foreign languages as an analogy seems to confirm, to me at least, that tongues is not a known language because of this uh, use of analogy. Now, we've been tossing around the gift of interpretation. If tongues is not a known foreign language, how can we interpret it? Well, first of all, we cannot interpret it. It requires a gift of interpretation that comes from the Holy Spirit. If tongues were a known foreign language, you'd never say it required a gift to interpret it, only a native speaker or someone who had learned it to translate it. I suppose if, you know, if somebody came in speaking a foreign language and, and you needed to understand them, you might say, hey, let's pray and ask God to give us supernaturally the ability to understand what this person is saying. Uh, and God could do that. That would be a miracle, right? But you, what you wouldn't do is what people do. They'd say, hey, what is this guy speaking Spanish? Which one of you is bilingual? Who can speak Spanish here? Don't you know a little bit of French? How about you, Gene? You're, you're an Italian. Do you know any Italian that isn't cuss words? Uh, you know, from... <laughs> from your parents and, you know, stuff like that. And, and so, I mean, it's insane to think what we need a gift, we need the gift of translation to be given to somebody who knows the language. It's, it's silly, really. So, uh, we cannot interpret it. It comes as a gift. Second of all, interpretation is not translation. I translate language. I can interpret a poem or a painting or a sculpture. I can give you the sense of what is happening or what the intention was. I can put into words. Picture is worth a thousand words, they say, but with a thousand words, you can do a pretty good job of, of explaining a picture. Uh, and, and so that's the idea here is that there, there is a way of interpreting, uh, our, you, know, you know, all the funny, you know, TV things and things in movies where people are looking at what they think is, is modern art and it was just somebody who, you know, who dropped paint on a canvas accidentally and put it up there, Mr. Bean or somebody like that, you know. And then there, the art critic is like, I, I sense the passion of the primeval man, you know, that kind of... And, and you know, it's all phony, but that, they're interpreting the artist's intent and that's what an interpretation of a tongue is. The interpretation will capture the theme of the utterance rather than the detail of each word. One charismatic author wrote, and he said, Paul assumes that some people are known to have the gift of interpretation. That's in verse 28. 
and ready to interpret a tongue that comes. Practically speaking, the best person to bring the interpretation is the one or ones who feel a rise of faith or excitement as the tongue is being brought and who get a sense of the theme of the tongue, not the detail, just the theme. If that is you, then you step out in faith. When I start to interpret, I only ever have the idea of the first couple of sentences, and I find that as I start to speak, God gives me the idea for the next sentence and so on. Remember, it is important that the interpretation is man speaking to God. And note that it is an interpretation, not a translation. This means that the interpretation will capture the theme of the utterance rather than the detail of each uh, sound. Now, verse 12, even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. There's nothing wrong with being zealous for spiritual gifts. There is a sense in which it would be better to be exercising gifts in a way that requires correction than to be not exercising them at all. Paul has some harsh things to say to the Corinthian church throughout this letter because of sinful situations they find themselves in, and he says some very direct things to them in this chapter about their exercise of the gifts, but he's still excited that they are exercising the gifts. He... he, um, He doesn't have to stir them up. They have a zeal for manifesting the presence of God in their midst. This is no excuse for allowing error or aberrant experiences. Many times I've heard charismatics defend all manner of weird behaviors by saying that when people are in a discovery mode, they should be expected to get a little out of order. It's interesting this issue was nothing new. It was raised during the Great Awakening and resulted in a conversation between John Wesley and George Whitfield. Wesley fiercely criticized Whitfield for allowing fanaticism to exist under his preaching. If you read about some of the phenomena in some of the revivals that happened when Whitfield was preaching, it sounds a lot like crazy stuff that goes on today. Whitfield acknowledged that not all that took place under his ministry was of God. Some of it was of the flesh, he said. Then stamp out the flesh and what is false, countered Wesley. But, said Whitfield, if you stamp out what is of the flesh, you will stamp out what is real as well. Now, I'm not sure that's true. And this is, this is an interesting point we could talk about uh, just, you know, in, in later on, uh, and we'll keep talking about it, but... Almost all the books that you read, uh, by, especially by guys that were once really conservative, even cessationists, who then came into the power and the empowering the baptism and the gifts of the Spirit, they all pretty universally uh, say that uh, just crazy things are bound to happen, and, and that that's just part and parcel of it, you know, and they say that it's... It's a step of faith to allow those crazy things to happen, and God will sort it all out. Um, I think really the answer is to correct people and to do things decently and in order. I'm not saying that people won't do crazy things. Or I I think really, I was thinking about this all day today, I think it's not so much that people do crazy things when the Holy Spirit falls upon them. I think that when the Holy Spirit is moving in a certain way, maybe in a time of revival, crazy people find that meeting. (laughs) And I don't mean crazy in a, de- uh, in a derogatory way. I mean people who are on the edge of charismania, who are looking for a place to entertain or to explore or to draw attention to themselves. And so, so and at least that's part of it. You know, so, so you'll hear that, hey, something's going on at this particular church. Man, they're packed out on Sunday nights and people are speaking in tongues and a guy was healed and this is happening. That Other people who follow phenomena like that, they're going to find that meeting and, and they're going to start doing things at that meeting. And then it's up to us to think, well, this is just the Holy Spirit going a little crazy because he's all bottled up all day. So he's like a genie, you know. That's the, the idea we have of the Holy Spirit, he's like a genie in a bottle and once he gets out, you know, he just goes for it for a while. You know, I haven't been able to be let loose in this church and now you're slain in the Spirit and you're barking like a dog and you're laughing your head off. All right, I got that out of my system. Let's, let's settle down. Those things happen, but I think it's up to the leadership to say, hey, let's, 
Let's talk about the Word of God because the Holy Spirit who wrote the Word of God isn't going to contradict himself by doing crazy stuff. And so, yes, crazy things are going to happen, but that doesn't mean we let them happen. Um, the believers who were out of order in Corinth needed to be corrected. That's what Paul was doing. He was correcting them. They needed to subordinate everything they said in public to the principle of building up others. And the only way to do that is to speak in ways that can be understood by them and to do so decently and in order, as we'll see. And so, so whether you're George Whitfield or whoever you are, and you say, well, we can't, we can't stamp out the false because it'll quench the real, Paul doesn't say that anywhere in this chapter. This is the chapter where he would say that. He'd say, hey, you guys are blowing it. You can keep speaking in tongues, but you got to do it the right way, and you can prophesy and do all these other things and, and everything in a balanced, decent way. One commentator had this insight. He said, the church as a whole should strive to have the gifts that build up its members. It should support those who serve in those capacities, and it should redirect its zeal from a desire to speak in tongues to a desire to serve the Lord in the best way that will build up the church. I like that last idea where he said, the best way that will build up the church. It's the Lord's church, and He knows the best way to build up each local expression of it. I might, or you might think, we are lacking in some gift or activity or discipline. It's possible we are. I mean, no, you know, I mean, obviously we're human beings and uh, we fallibly follow the Lord, but it's also possible that I have my own ideas and agenda that is different from the Lord's. If I come into a group if I come into a local church and say this should, and I have an idea that this is what should be happening in this local church, um, I have to be careful to see if that's from the Lord or if that's just something I think should be happening in that church. It doesn't matter if I'm part of the leadership or I just got there the first day. This is why it's always interesting to me, and this is just a personal observation. Uh, again, I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but. It's always interesting to me when a first-time visitor to a church exercises abnormal freedom to do things that other people who attend the church aren't doing, usually uh, during the worship, standing, screaming, shouting, talking in between, so, you know, those kinds of things that are more associated with Pentecostal worship. And, and so you're there for the very first time. And so basically what you're saying is, the rest of you people who come here all the time don't know what God intends for you. This is my first Sunday here, but I already know exactly how God is moving in this fellowship. I know everything He's doing or wants to do, I'm going to bring you up to speed. And, and that's just not true. There are seasons in every church. I was reading, I think you, I told you last week, I quoted from John Piper, who's a notable Reformed scholar, <clears throat> but who's also a continuationist. And he says, yeah, he goes, yeah, our, you know, we speak in tongues at our church, but it's rare and it goes through seasons where there'll be a season where it seems like that gift is being exercised more than other gifts, and then it'll be gone for a long time. And so the idea is that uh, I might have my own idea uh, of what needs to happen or what I'd like to see happen, uh, but it's also possible that it's not what the Lord is doing at that time. And you know what? I have to defer to the Lord because He knows the hearts of every one of us. And He knows what we need to hear and what needs to happen in our assembly. And so, remember that old song we used to sing? Wait, wait, wait on the Lord. We must wait, wait, wait on the Lord. It's like elevator music now, but it's Christian elevator music, you know. But, but uh, we wait on the Lord to direct us in the things that He knows from searching our hearts that we definitely need. Uh, so we can encourage to, you know, especially, you know, if you, if, if there aren't a lot, if you, if you have a meeting and there aren't a lot of gifts of the spirit being exercised, then you're in a discovery mode. Then you can encourage that. If you're in a meeting and there's a lot of people exercising gifts and some of them are getting out of order, then you correct that. And so you just deal with what God is doing in the life of that fellowship represented by the people that are there.